Hello, and welcome to the Battle of Tassafaranga. Now, this was quite an interesting one to do, and quite an interesting one to discuss, because... How do I put this mildly? There are a few battles in history more likely to drive anyone thinking about them from a strategic perspective completely, and I mean completely, off a cliff than looking at this battle. There really isn't. It is a battle... Okay. Let's start again. Let's get in this. Guadalcanal. Why are we fighting Guadalcanal in the first place? That green arrow on this car side, that's Singapore. This is Australia. This, that up there, well, that's Pearl Harbor. And we then have Japan at the top. And I think that arrow might have moved slightly, but Guadalcanal is the red one. Guadalcanal is the red one. It is an island which is being fought over because of the need desire to fight over it. And let me explain this. So, if you have an airbase at Guadalcanal, you can control quite a patch of ocean and make it very difficult for convoys to get past. It's Mediterranean Combat 101. However, for you to have control of that island, in order to have that airbase, you first have to have got to that airbase, uh, well, that to that island, and built the airbase. The airbase doesn't exist. So it becomes kind of like building, I don't know, a baseball field diamond in the middle of a cornfield, or a rugby pitch in the middle of a Welsh valley. I build it, they will come. If the Japanese hadn't invaded Guadalcanal and tried to build the airfield, the Americans would have never invaded Guadalcanal because they didn't really want to go there. No one really wants to go there. And you end up having a six-month-long campaign fighting over these waters. Guadalcanal is a little bit down below. This is the slot. Okay, this is... The area on the map, which frankly is not a good place to go to. It's not a nice place to be. The slot is a ch narrow area where ships would rush down the Tokyo Express or the various American convoys and would fight each other. And you end up with this lovely place called Iron Bottom Sound. So you are having in the vast, it's, how do I explain it? It's like when the Royal Navy decides to have not, where the Royal Navy and the Germans fight the Battle of Narvik, the third one, and the second one. They're fighting inside a field. They had the vastness of the Atlantic Ocean to go and have their duking out match. They're having the fight in a little fjord. Now, you can argue this is because of amphibious reasons, like Guadalcanal, because they're supporting ground forces. But let's put it in another phrase. Let's say you have a hamlet, three or four houses, in the middle of a vast ocean of fields. And instead of fighting a war of maneuver, you end up deciding to fight urban warfare in that hamlet. And you turn that hamlet into a micro version of Stalingrad. This is Guadalcanal. 
this is what we're talking about. We are talking about a ha we are talking about something which honestly no one really thought about, wanted, bothered. The people who live there probably care about it. In fact, I'm sure they do. Everyone else. It didn't figure in their calculations. Until the Japanese shot with a very half-hearted attempt. Because, again, if you are going to pick such an isolated spot so far from you. Well, surely a sensible strategy and doctrine. And, of course, this is the Japanese we're talking about. And sensible strategy and doctrine does not seem to be two words which... Um, well, a phrase which goes together a lot when we're talking about the Japanese war effort, especially not the beginning of the world of World War Two. You would have thought, if I'm going to make this, if I'm going to go for this, and by the way, the mess you're going to achieve is you're going to make the convoy routes from America to Australia a little bit longer, but let's be honest, they're not going to be that much longer on the scale of things, because they're having to cross the entire freaking Pacific, and also go from the North Pacific, North, basically do a, you know, a diagonal across the Pacific, so they're already going across it, not that way, but that way, which is already long enough, you're just basically saying, right then, instead of doing that, you're going to have to do that. And go for a lower point on, you know, on, on Australia. My argument is, its strategic value or worth to the Japanese is doesn't really warrant any effort, but they do it, and they build, they start building an airfield, and they don't secure it. There are memories of a certain Malaya campaign coming here, for anyone who's been playing close for tension. And this is why I end up with a huge slide to try and explain the situation. Because, honestly, I can't really explain the situation. No one can. It shouldn't happen. It's not supposed to happen. It's not a sensible scenario for anyone for this to happen. In fact, for it to happen means something has seriously gone wrong. Let's do a sort of a rough overview. On the 7th of August, 1942, Allied forces landed on Guadalcanal, and it's a complete surprise to the Japanese. Now, this is justified because of the Japanese are starting to build bases there. The Japanese landed a force of roughly 2,500 personnel. There are some people who claim it's 3,000. There are some who claim it's as little as 2,000. We can all agree that when you turn up with 11,000 troops, though, you're probably turning up with about 4 to 1 superiority in numbers. Especially as the Japanese personnel seem to be quite heavy on people who don't actually do ground warfare as a rule. It's beyond the level at which um, the Japanese can support. And let's go back to this map again. Someone tried to tell me it's on the route of march for the Americans to go up the island hopping campaign. And again, there are better, bigger, prettier islands than this. I would also point out that for this to even be possible, this operation, for the Americans to even conceive of actually going and taking Guadalcanal, they have to first uh, change the areas of command for, uh, between Nimitz and MacArthur. MacArthur doesn't want to do it. The army doesn't want to do it. Nimitz really isn't that keen on doing it, but King, King is. And so they changed Nimitz's area of control by roughly, well, as little as 60 miles at some points, as much as 360 miles at other points, to make sure it's, there is a contiguous chain of command and that one person is in charge of the whole thing. 
Yep. Now, the Japanese have been building an island at Lunga Point that's now going to be renamed and called Henderson Field and going to become home to the Cactus Air Force. And, um, well, here is the first example of, okay, well, not actually the first example. We've got the Malayan level of stupidity. They've gone to an island which they can't defend, which is nowhere near anywhere they can support it from. And they've started building an airfield. And now someone's turned up and taken it off them. And the reason they were building an airfield is once you've got control of the airfield, you make attack on the islands very, very difficult. I, it's going to cost a lot more than it's worth to do it. And you know that because you were building an airfield in the first place. And the Japanese response is it to try and withdraw the personal they, the personnel they still had left on the island? No. No. We don't withdraw. We're an Axis power. We reinforce failure. At every single opportunity. So, the Allies have landed with, let's be honest, mostly US Marines, have landed 11,000 troops. 11,000 troops. These, over the next eight to ten weeks, will be brought up to roughly 20,000 troops. Most of which are concentrated around the airfield, which is, bar none, the only important piece of real estate on the island, which actually matters to anyone. We can thank the Lord for a very, very sensible general on the American side, who basically said, hmm, this island, shall I fight for all of it, or shall I just control the bits that matter? I'm not going to wipe out my own troops. I'm going to control the bits that matter. We can all be thankful for that. Japanese. Now, oh. they put uh, their 17th army, or which is more of a core-sized force than an actual army, as we probably consider it in sort of other context units. And it's under the charge of Lieutenant General Harukuti Hakitaki. And, um, well, this 17th Army, their reinforcements start to arrive in the area on the 19th. So, 12 days later, tr Japanese troops start to trickle in. However, there is a small problem. And just a small problem. The Americans have aircraft operating from the airfield. Their submarines are nearby and doing <laughs> their job. And the Americans also really near enough, as makes no difference, have local sea superiority. And when I say they have local sea superiority, we're actually going to be talking about a battle where you could technically, if you're going by losses, suggest that the Americans lost it. So, uh, yeah, the Japanese attempt to recapture Henderson Field several times, and they start to burn through their supplies, the supplies they brought with them, the supplies they had, um, their actual last attempts to land significant ground reinforcements take place on the 12th and the 15th and all these reinforcements do really is put more of a strain on the supplies they actually have ashore it's frankly probably the worst scenario you can think about they are throwing away a mobile force they had they're throwing away a fairly decent army and um what they decide to do, and instead of withdrawal, is they now um, set up the Japanese 8th Area Army under the command of Lieutenant General Hitoshi, Hitoshi Imanru at Rabul. And he's in charge of the 18th Army in New Guinea 
and the 17th Army in the Solomons, pretty much concentrated in Guadalcanal. There is going to be sarcasm in this. If you haven't detected that already, or you don't have the ability to take sarcasm, I'm giving you a heads up now. There is a lot of sarcasm coming up because the strategic situation is basically one large sarcastic, oh my god, why are they doing this? So, the supply crisis, as you can imagine, starts to get pretty bad. And the supply crisis is of their own creation. They have lost the airfield, which means they can't control the sea around it, or the air around it, which means they can't bring in the big freighters to resupply it, uh, resupply their troops ashore. And then they have grown their garrison massively, so they've grown their supply requirements massively, the number of troops there. So they both have more trouble supplying those troops, and they have more troops to supply. See a small issue going on here. Oh, and by the way, this is all fighting over an airfield, which they built, started the construction of in the first place and have lost because they didn't have enough garrison there in the first place. Oh, and by the way, this airfield, whilst it does offer some protection for Rabul, let's be honest, actually concentrating those forces around Rabul or having them in New Guinea might have made a difference to those campaigns. Uh, well, might have made a difference in the Guinea campaign. They might have actually had more of a chance there. Trying to do this here, you're, you are reinforcing failure. So, at this point, they make repeated appeals to the Navy. So, beginning on November the 16th, 1942... And lasting roughly three weeks and involving roughly 20 odd trips. 16 submarines, one of them doing a trip, uh, basically, one, uh, one of the, uh, from a pool of 16 submarines, one would do it a day. Uh, some did multiple trips, some only did one. We used to make nocturnal deliveries of foodstuffs to the island. However, here is the problem. Okay, so now. Not only is the airfield the only point that really matters on the island, the airfield is also the only area which has, I don't know, spaces which are cleared for store foodstuffs, some form of road network to move stuff around, um, all those things which make logistics, I don't know, what's the word, work. We're not going to get onto the good admiral. We are not going to get on the good admiral till I've got through all the sarcasm out of my system. So they have to man pack the stuff through the jungle, and this is the point at which I don't know. You really need the Japanese to have taken a lesson from the Viet Cong, because if a force could man pack logistics, it's the Viet Cong. If we look at them in history. Although they did come up with some quite clever and genius ways of how to use motorbikes and various other things as well. But. The Japanese are having to man pack the supplies forward. And this means that even though the submarines are pretty much every day delivering between 20 and 30 tons, which is enough for the next day's worth of food. A good portion of that food is spoiling before it can go anywhere. A good portion of that food never gets anywhere, even when it doesn't spoil. And by the 26th, 10 days into the runs, some frontline units had not had any food supplied to them for six days. So I'm presuming they were pretty hungry. And even the rear area troops, i.e. the ones who are closest to where the supplies are being dropped off, are down to one third rations. Again, the second Axis motto of World War II is starting to come true. Uh, the first being always reinforce failure. Second being logistics is something that happens to other people. 
they are doughty, doughty warriors, and you have uh, the Japanese are hard fighters, but um, strategic joined up thinking does not seem to be playing a part in this whole uh, in part of this campaign. So now they thought, well, let's try destroyers again, and this is the plan. And I'm not joking about this plan, okay? I am not joking. The plan developed by 8th Fleet, Fleet was... And this was in order to reduce the exposure of destroyers when they're delivering, so they can deliver more quickly and then get away. Was to use large oil or gas drums, which were cleaned thoroughly and filled with medical supplies and food, and enough airspace to provide buoyancy, and strung together with rope. When the destroyers arrived at Guadalcanal, they would make a sharp turn. The drums would be cut loose, and therefore a swimmer or boat from the shore could come out, pick up the buoyed end of the rope, and return it to the beach, where the soldiers could haul in the supplies. I'm going to read what I wrote, because if I don't, I'm going to get rude. Does this sound desperate? Foolish? Possibly absurd? Does this sound like if this is what we are having to do, perhaps we should be instead doing a reverse and, and having the soldiers tied together with ropes on things that float and pick them up with destroyers? If it does sound like that to you, then you are probably in the modicum of... In, of the population, which is not going to reinforce failure. I'm hoping you are the vast majority. Because, yes, it is an ingenious plan, but it's at that point of, if this is what we're having to do to supply this force, why do we have a force there in the first place? And what serious army, serious force, thinks they can supply a force like this and actually win or maintain a campaign? You can't. It's not possible. Honestly, the submarine resupply was not possible. Honestly, back at the beginning, when they lost on the 7th of August, they should have just gone 8th August, we will start withdrawing. Covered of withdrawal. Withdraw whatever troops we can from there, and whatever supplies. Give it up. It's nowhere near us. It's nowhere really near New Guinea. And let the if the Americans want it, let them have it. Because mm, it was a nice to have, possibly a strategic gamble, which would have been interesting. But we failed. Let's go home. Let's save our resources. Let's harbor our forces and, and, and husband them carefully so that we can maintain for the critical battle to come. Let's actually, I don't know. Implement the Kantai Kessin Doctrine, shall we? It's the one we claim we signed up to. No? Okay. <sighs> what they actually do is tell eight destroyers decide to use eight destroyers. Two would be escorts. And the six carrying, uh, six others each carrying two to 100 to 240 drums of supplies. Um. Oh, to make space for these supplies, they wouldn't carry any reloads of torpedoes, so they just have the ones in their launchers. So they'd only have eight long lance torpedoes each. That's still probably enough. Oh. Now we're coming to a sane, good officer. And he is an interesting character, but from this point in the story, this point in history, he is the voice of reason and sanity. He's the one who ends up commanding the destroyers and having to go in. Uh, but Rizio Tanaka basically manages to upset his high command 
by asking such curious questions as why in the name of all things holy am I having to do this? And he doesn't put it in those terms. He's not quite as rude as a modern naval historian can be. But he does seem to upset them by going, what are we doing here? What is the point in me risking my ships for this? What I would also find it to say is something I find interesting about the Japanese command structure is he is, in RN terms, a flotilla leader. In RN terms, he'd be a senior captain. But that would be it. He wouldn't be a rear admiral. And it's quite interesting when we get into the force, looking at what he's been doing. He's been a trusted right hand of many senior officers, with far more senior officers. He's been the one who they have trusted to go to them. Are you quite sure? But the trouble is you can only say that so often. You can only get away with that so often. And whilst he would get to a vice admiral in 1944, and despite having some success in this battle, his asking polite versions of um, why are you throwing away my ships on this stupid stuff meant that when his injuries he would sustain in December 1942 on another Tokyo Express run, and this is of course the Tokyo Express runs, would be used to see him remove um, first to Singapore and then to shore duty in Burma. What can I say? He is a good officer. Next one is um, a more interesting and nuanced officer. You honestly can't fault his preparation. He does do a logical preparation for this, and uh, he does do some good things in his career. However, he's also the admiral in charge of the Port of Chicago disaster, and the one who ends up deciding to make examples of the companies, um, the, the, the groups of men who are supposed to be involved in loading and unloading ammunition ships. There is certainly an argument that whilst you can understand the pressures of war, make it for um, fit wearing on him and making him think that going for a hard line approach and making examples was necessary for the war effort and certainly the navy tried to stick by their man as long as they could on that one even to quite recent times when you look at the british handling and the way certain uh, the more successful officers have handled things in terms of the Invergordon mutiny and various other issues in the past, there seems to me. How do I put this? Perhaps I'm wrong comparing institutions, but I also I I I am. Whenever I read about a mutiny, I think about Admiral Duncan. And I think about how he dealt with the mutiny of Nor and etc. affecting his fleet before Camperdown. And yes, famously, he does hold a man over the side of his ship. One arm to basically go, I do you really want to try and take my command from me? But he also 
tells the men, honestly, he will go and campaign for them to get better rations. He does look after them. He makes sure he sorts out their clothing from his own funds and all sorts of things to make sure they're okay. And so there is a sort of there's a real bond of trust between him and the men. They know he's hard and he is prepared to make an example, although that nothing happens to that guy afterwards. You that's always the thing. When the guy says no, drop down, let back to go back around, that's fine. He doesn't make a long term example of him. He's used him, then start, then lets him go back to hide in anonymity. And his fleet goes on and fights the Battle of Camperdown. Now, the Dutch at that time, it was a really big threat. We think, we think about the Pier of Trafalgar and all these things as big threats. But when half the Royal Navy is mutinying because of its state of pay and food and treatment by some of the officers, that's a really dangerous time. The Dutch fleet coming out, they're really dangerous. They are far scarier in many respects than the French fleet and the Spanish fleet. Because the Dutch are considered very good sailors and very capable naval officers. And they haven't got a fleet which has been ravaged by revolution and successive purges for various things of officers. They've got a fleet which has been homogenized, has experience, has got all the things built up into it. So, he manages to bring that fleet, his fleet together and win the battle. And he does that by in many ways, emphasizing a carrot over a stick. He makes sure the stick's visible. But it's kind of a model of Roosevelt in that, you know, the waters at Roosevelt's walk softly and carry a big stick. He's got a big stick and he makes sure you see it. And he's what but he's not really walking softly, he's quite loud. But in the other hand, he's got food. Your money, your clothes, all the things you need, and making sure you get treated and making sure you get heard by the Admiralty. And basically, he presented as you continue serving, you do your duty for the Queen, you have uh, you King and Country, you have me on your side, and I am an Admiral. They will have to listen to me. Not you will behave me, but if you follow me, I will stand up for you because then you are my men. And also, there's this sort of interesting thing about Wright in that I think he has many good qualities. But I think the trouble is he's a very much a letter of the rule officer. So this is one of those interesting scenarios where I'm sitting in here and I'm looking at these officers and... Well... I'm British, so I'm supporter of the Allies, of course, and I think possibly had family involved, various things, uh, various parts of this. But there's also part of me sitting here thinking, after two officers, the one I feel most sorry for the way he's treated afterwards by his respective service is this one because i don't think he warrants it and i think he's a very good officer this is an officer who well we'll talk about his plan of action later and i think that plan of action possibly is what helps to lead to some of the issues so here is the japanese force the escorting force is a nagami uh, under rear admiral rezo tanaka uh, with Commander Konabi Tsutsutao out on the Tsutsu. And Takanmi. It's all destroyers. He hasn't got his light cruiser anymore. He hasn't, he's just got destroyers, and it's his squadron. Destroyer Squadron 2. He's asked to plan the operation, he takes his own destroyer squadron. 
The transport force is divided up into two forces. One is going to Tassafaranga Point. One is supposed to veer off elsewhere, but um, hmm. life happens. And pretty much each of these divisions are comprised of a different group of destroyers. Each of these divisions are comprised of a different group. Now, Nagami, Nami, uh, Takanami, and Makemimi are Yugumu class destroyers. So, they're the top vessel. Rather cute. Nice design, nice lines. You could consider them slightly top heavy, but they're designed in the Japanese style, so they have quite a heavy uh, fire, gun armament, although it has good forward beam views, but it's mainly concentrated at the rear, because they're supposed to go in, deliver a heavy torpedo attack, retreat behind smoke with their guns firing, and rearm their torpedoes, and then come back in again. So there is a reasoning behind this argument, this armament distribution. We then have Oyosho and Kagru, which are both Kagru class. Although, please note, that isn't Kag uh, that uh, that uh, from that class. Uh, this is gonna sound terrible. I've actually got Yukazaki's Yukazi uh, pictured, and that's the bottom left on your screen. Or this one. And finally, we have Suzuki and Kawazi, who are both Shiriatsu class. And this picture is actually of ah, Suzuki. It's a which means apparently cool breeze, but I'm never quite sure about the translations of some of the Japanese names. So, we have three really big new destroyers, we have three quite big new destroyers, and we have two smaller fairly new destroyers. Because this is laid down 1935, Commission 1937 will be stricken in 1944. Although it was sunk by Skipjack in 1944, so uh, they, they, they basically they strike it in March after it's been sunk in January. Uh, the Kakaru class involved, well, they're laid down 37. Commissioned 39. Three new ships, and then we have Nagani, which is laid down in 1941, and actually commissioned and completed in 42. So she is brand new. And really. I would argue these are some of the better destroyers the Japanese have available. So Destroyer Squadron 2, well armed. Let's consider Task Force 67. Well, in the Vanguard you have, well, four destroyers, of which Maori seems to be an interesting vessel. And I say interesting in that I'm not sure whether she has working radar for this operation or not. There seems to be a debate about this, and that makes me worried. I would presume you should know if you have radar fitted or not. Uh, There are radars available which could have fitted on her, but she's also one of the oldest destroyers involved in this from the American side, so 
She's a grizzly class. They're special. But we have the front four destroyers under Commander William Cole. And he's in USS Fletcher, which is, surprising enough, a Fletcher class. We can all be quite surprised by that. Then we have Carlton Wright, a Rear Admiral in Minneapolis. That's his command ship. And we then have another set of cruisers and the rear Hamrel Mallon as S. Tisdale, which includes Honolulu and Northampton. The Americans are going to have four different classes of cruisers here. Uh, one of the things is New um, USS Minneapolis and New Orleans so both coasts are, of course, both New Orleans class. But the rest of the cruisers, they're all one off of their cl classes. So it's Pensacola. It is a Pensacola class cruiser. Lead ship of it. Honolulu is a Brooklyn class light cruiser. Northampton is, you're going to never guess what, she's the lead ship of the Northampton class cruisers. Whew. And then we have Lanson and Lava. Now, these two destroyers are actually attached late to the cat uh, group. And so they get put in the rear because they haven't had a chance to practice. So, hmm. One of the nice things is there is actually this picture, which is of the destroyers leading the cruisers. On November the 30th, heading for Guadalcanal. So these are the four classes of cruisers. Now, our light cruiser, Honolulu, is of course the one at the top there. But the rest of these are all pretty cool. And I like the American 8-inch cruisers. I do. USS New Orleans represents the New Orleans class, so that's her in Minneapolis. This is what they look like. Then we have USS Northampton and USS Pensacola. They are good, strong ships. Again, you start to think this is quite a heavy force being sent in by the Americans. And then we have the destroyers. One on top. Grigory class. Single stacker. USS Mori. I don't know. There is something about her that does look cute. And it does seem to like she's for setting the standard for the stars which come after her. Then we have a Gleaves class. USS Lana. A Fletcher class. USS Fletcher, of course. And the Mahan class. USS Drayton. Mahan class are one of these classes of destroyer which really don't get enough love. They are absolutely amazing at the beginning of the war for the Americans, but they get so little love. And the US Navy has 18 of them. They lose six of them in combat, and they, put a, they all do a good job. Admittedly, I do find it slightly interesting that the guy who is most famous for arguing for a battle fleet and are making the case for a battle fleet so well does he make it that actually America starts to get a battle fleet and to an extent actually fund their armed forces properly and yet are the class of destroyers are named for him. There is something deliciously ironic about that. Deliciously so. Now, here's the prelude to battle. So, Task Force 67, they're formed on November 24th. On the orders of William Halsey, and originally they're commanded by Thomas Kincaid. Kincaid is one of the most fightingest admirals in the US Navy. He is also one of the most respected and, to an extent, loved officers in the US Navy by sailors and a lot of others. So, he, he is a really, really well-respected officer. He's needed elsewhere, though. So he's replaced by Wright. On the 28th. So he's actually in command for four days. 
And then the 29th, they start heading off on the 30th of the actual battle. So Wright's been in charge for two days when this battle happened. So this is a force which has been in flux. Heavy flux. The plan of action is, I would say, conceived probably by Kincaid, implemented by Wright. And it's simple. Radar equipped destroyers with scout in front of the cruisers. Uh, if we go back to this, that is where I start to worry about the Mori. Because, theoretically, not radar equipped at this point. Definitely not listed as having one. And not working. Uh, so, yeah. You, I suppose you've got three out of four and she's with her pals. All right. They would surprise the enemy with a torpedo attack and then withdraw to allow the cruisers a clear field of fire. Still, no one has twigged at this point about the Type 93 and its long range and the long range of Lance torpedo. Long Lance is torpedoes range. They still presume there is torpedoes are roughly equivalent. And withdraw then withdraw to allow the cruisers a clear field of fire. Which they would carry out from a range of ten to twelve thousand yards, that's nine to eleven kilometers, with the assistance of their float planes dropping flares. It's hard to fault the doctrine, really. If you can silhouette the enemy with your flares dropped by your float planes, you should have a, a great firing target. Some small points of error, or not so much error, issue issue with this plan. A, your float planes are float planes, and they are they're going to have to land on what an airfield. Hopefully, they're going to divert to Henderson Field to land at Henderson Field at night, or are they going to try and land on the water near your cruiser in darkness? Or is your cruiser going to have to put up a lot of searchlights for the float plane to know where to land? We'll leave that to one side. Uh, the float planes are also going to be dropping a lot of flares, which will probably reveal the enemy positions, but might also reveal their positions, and more importantly, could well reveal your positions as well. So this is going to be interesting, especially if any of the float planes in the dark, I don't know, make a, mis a, a misidentification and for some reason drop flares near you rather than the enemy. But, no worries. And of course there's the fact that if your destroyers are withdrawing, you're possibly going to lose track of them and you might end up firing on them because you might mistake the destroyers withdrawing for the enemy attacking. Or, alternatively, you might think the enemy attacking are your destroyers withdrawing and not fire on them. And yes, your destroyers do need to withdraw, but... If they fire their torpedoes, what are you expecting to break up into pairs or go off as a four and somewhere? And it seems rather a waste of destroyers. It might be because of me looking at tribal class destroyers and what their night attack doctrine was, which was basically fire torpedoes and illuminate the targets with our gunfire, because we will presumably see them, so the bigger ships can target in based on us illuminating the enemy by firing guns at them. I there that that uh, don't take this the wrong way. That tactic is fundamentally slightly nuts, but for some reason the logic of that appeals more to me than the logic of my destroyers going off somewhere else in the dark without me being able to keep track of them and possibly me ending up engaging them. Because at least if I if they're firing on the enemy, I know which is which. I can pick out the ones which are blasting. <laughs> And look like they're firing like my ships. But, um, anyway, so on the 29th of November, the Allied intelligence intercepted a message from the 17th Army on Guadalcanal alerting them to Tanaka's planned resupply attempt. That's helpful. Breaking the Army's comms reveals that the Navy is coming to try and get them out of trouble. Anyway, Halsey orders Wright to intercept. 
On his way in, Wright gets an update from Paul Mason, an Australian coast watcher, about them leaving and, the, and the, the, basically the, roughly what the Japanese were doing. The Japanese, thanks to Tanaka's careful manoeuvring, managed to avoid most Allied attempts at air spotting. In fact, it, there's a debate as to whether they're spotted at all. However, Wright does get spotted. Which leads to Tanaka issuing new orders, which actually possibly will get him into real trouble. And basically the idea is if there's a fight with the enemy, then uh, with the US Navy, in such an event, utmost efforts will be made to destroy the enemy without regard for the unloading of supplies. Now, his primary mission is to unload the supplies. So if he fails to do that, you can say that's a win for the Americans. However, if you're Tanaka, and if you're thinking sensibly about the Japanese force at this point, you might well have decided you're writing off 17th Army as a lost cause, and frankly the entire island as a stupid, wa a stupid waste of effort. And you might not be willing to get your entire fleet sunk for that effort. However, if you can take out enough American heavy cruisers, then theoretically, if that big battle eventually does come, and the American battle fleet eventually does do what you, you're hoping to do and roll up in, in close and actually fight you, especially if they do that while those the cruisers are in repair or they're having to build new ones, because as far as the Americans can magic gut stuff up, they can't make things appear by clicking their fingers. They have to actually build them, and it suddenly becomes worthwhile. It suddenly starts to fit doctrine. It also changes the metric of victory. Because it means the metric of victory as Tanaka sees it is taking out a lot of the enemy. The metric for victory as his high command sees it is supplying the 17th army. The metric of victory as the Americans see it depends on who you're talking to at the time. But let's be honest, the metric of victory they want is to stop the resupply and take out a lot of the Japanese. Mm, they're not going to get that wish. So this is a map of the battle that the US Navy produced. At 9.40 on November the 30th at night, Tanaka's ship sighted Savo Island from the indispensable strait. The Japanese ships were in a line ahead formation, as illustrated on this map. Um, roughly 600 meters or 660 yards between each ship. In order of Takani, Ayashu, Kuryushu, Kagru, Makina, Makinami, Naganami, Kawazi, and Susaki. Uh, At this time, Task Force 67 entered the Lengo Channel en route to Iron Bottom Sound. Which, if we go back to this little thing earlier, is not a good place to be if you're the Americans, okay? Iron Bottom Sound doesn't look like a good place to go. In fact, honestly, I could think of better places to go for a holiday. Uh, if I had been a sailor in Task Force 67, by about this point, I'd be asking for my money back from my travel agent. But, they were sailing in order of Fletcher, Perkins, Murray, Thrayton, Minneapolis, New Orleans, Pensacola, Honolulu, Northampton, Lampsa, and Lama. The four van destroyers were roughly 4,000 yards ahead of the cruisers, and the cruisers steamed roughly 1,000 yards apart. At 22.40 hours, that's 10.40 at night, Tanaka ships passed up a Savo Island. Um, three miles from Guadalcanal and slow to 12 knots as they approach the unloading area. If you look at this map, you can see what they're planning on doing.
Takanami uh, took station about one mile seaward to screen this co column. That, of course, being one of the escort forts, not Naganami, which is uh, Tanaka's ship, but um, Ogura Masami's ship. At the same time, Task Force 67 exited Lengo Channel into the sound and headed at 20 knots towards Savo Island. Wright's van destroyers moved into a position slightly inshore of the cruisers, and the sky was a moonless night. Mm. In fact, it would ri the, the moon would rise after midnight, so at this point it was still dark. And there's roughly two to seven miles worth of visibility. Seas were extremely calm which created a suction effect on their pontoons. So Wright's cruiser float planes were delayed in taking off from Tulagi Harbour, and so they wouldn't be a factor in the battle. He had got round the problem of, as I was pointing out, of the float planes landing and taking off by deploying them to Tulagi Harbour to take off and land back there. That's how he got round the night operation of float planes. But the other problem with deploying them away is that they now are away from you. They are not able to assist. They are not able to support you. And in as in case they are late coming, they don't take part in the battle. So if, if you have them with you, you can't recover them. If you have them operating from another base, then you can't rely on them being there on time and being there to support you because you, you've distributed command and control. You've got them away from you. At 2306, that's 1106 at night, Wright's force began to detect Tanaka's ships on radar near Cape Esperance on Guadalcanal. Uh, about, they thought they were roughly 21 kilometers away of 23,000 yards. Wright's destroyers rejoined the column as it continued towards Servo. At the same time, Tanaka ships, which were not equipped with radar, split into two groups and prepared to shove the drums overboard. Nagami, Kwaziki, and Saki headed to their drop-off point near Dorma Reef, while Man uh, Mankinami, Kangaroo, Oyashu, and Kuroyashu aimed for Tasafaronga. At 23.12, that's six minutes later, or uh, six minutes later, Takanami's crew visually sighted Wright's column. This was quickly confirmed by the lookouts on other ships. Tanaka orders unloading operations halted and all ships are ordered to attack. At 23.14, that's 11.14, so now the actual fight's been going on, uh, hasn't really started, but it's eight minutes since they Wright's force, and this was mainly Fletcher, have managed to uh, start to establish radar contact. Fletcher established a firm radar contact with Pak uh, Pakanami and the lead group of four drum-carrying destroyers. At... Roughly a minute later, with the range down to 7,000 yards, or 6.4 kilometers, William M. Cole, commander of the destroyer group and captain of Fletcher, radios right for permission to fire his torpedoes. Radios for mission. Right waits a further two minutes and then responds with range on bogies, that's the ships, the Tanag ship, excessive at present. Cole responds, range is fine. Now, remember, they have, in under the plan of the attack, it had been to start, commence firing at between 10 and 12,000 yards. So, 7,000 yards should have been more than fine. But no. Cole responds, range is fine, I said, and it takes two more minutes for right to respond with permission to fire. So if we consider this, Cole probably asked for mission roughly 2315. 
it's probably 2320 before they get permission back. And this means that in that time, the US destroyer's targets managed to escape from an Ottoman firing, Ottoman firing setup ahead to a marginal position passing a beam. And this means that when at 2320, that's 1120 hours a night, Fletcher, Perkins and Drayton fire their 20 Mark 15 to uh, torpedoes towards Snaka's ships. Maury, which lacked a radar and had no contacts, had to withheld, uh, withhold its fire. So they fired 20 torpedoes. They've now, after five, because of five minutes passing, they are no longer at optimal position by any stretch of the imagination. At the same time, Wright orders his force to open fire. So instead of the destroyers supposed to be firing their torpedoes and getting out the way and then the cruisers firing and having flares dropped by float planes, the entire plan has gone to pot. You've not had the you've had the torpedoes fired at the same time and by only the ships which could fire them, which didn't include Mori, who doesn't have radar, fire and not, not able to fire. So torpedo attack has gone down. You've got three ships firing torpedoes instead of four. You have no flares to silhouette the, en silhouette the enemy, and your guns are opening fire almost immediately as soon as your torpedoes are fired, which is going to give your enemy a heads up there under attack, so they might start maneuvering, which means you're possibly going to muck up your own torpedo, uh, to torpedo firing solution, which was already, thanks to delay of five minutes, at a tangential point. Okay. Now, there is a debate about this because I said the original plan was for the destroyers to get out the way and for the float planes to drop flares. But I'm uh, there. There seems to be some idea, well, in Cole's mind at least, that if in doubt, fire illuminations, um, uh, star shells to illuminate the targets, as previously directed, and then increase speed to clear the area for the cruise to operate. So basically, the destroyers took on providing the flares. Most of Wright's column decide that they're going to target at Takanami. Again, there doesn't seem to be any distribution of fire. Then uh, Wright has this is twenty three twenty one. They've been detecting the ships for the last fifteen minutes, and again, no one's gone through a process of working out where we should be firing. So almost all the cruisers seem to concentrate on. One destroyer. Takanami returns fire, launches a full load of eight torpedoes. She's set a fire and incapacitated quite quickly within four minutes, so she doesn't get off the reload. So this is actually quite good for the Americans because they've taken out the commander of the destroyers. They've taken out one of the destroyers, which actually is carrying torpedo reloads. They've done this. This is good. But the trouble is, you probably didn't need all five cruisers or four out of five cruisers concentrating their gunfire on one destroyer to achieve that in four minutes. None of these ranges. And we're talking of ranges of 6,000 yards or less. That's point blank range for an eight inch or six inch gun. That really isn't. This is not a critique of the crews involved. The crews are very brave. The critique, if it's anything, is of <clears throat> Mr. Wright, Admiral Wright. <sighs> As Tanaki's destroyed, can I rest the Tanaki's ship? Which were pretty much being ignored. Increasing increased speed, maneuvering, 
and started responding. Surprisingly, all the American torpedoes missed. Um, there are some historians who um, claim that if they did, these torpedoes must have been fatally flawed or issues because otherwise the outcome of the battle would be different because you know these torpedoes would have caused damage. No, they were fired at a terrible salu firing solution. Less of them really were fired than were supposed to be in the first mass salvo. 20 uh, and it just it's no the the torpedoes if you're firing them at a when if you the point is if you fire them five minutes earlier they have a chance of hitting the enemy before they realize you're there Yes, they know you're there, but they don't know you have a solution on them and then you're not firing. You haven't given them the information that you know them. They don't see your torpedo splashes at night. It's not going to be that visible. So the torpedoes have a chance to engage an enemy who's not manoeuvring, who's going slowly, who are in a straight line. That would have caused trouble. This... At this point, it's not the torpedoes' fault. I am no lover of the Mark 15 or Mark 14 torpedoes. Neither of them are particularly brilliant. But at this point, it's not the torpedoes' fault. It's the user. It's problem in chair, not in torpedo. It's picnic, not picnic. Problem in chair, not in computer. For those who are IT technicians, you all have heard that, uh, that expression. For those who aren't, you, if you've ever heard IT professionals around you talking about picnics, be very afraid for what they think of your computer skills. Now, look, I got it wrong a second ago. I said um, Takanami, which was Tanaka's flagship. Sorry, that wasn't that. Was I'll go on ship? <sighs> Sorry, apologies on that one. Naganai is Tanaka's flagship, and he's very much still in charge. That was they estimated their victory. Sorry. Tanaka's flagship, Nagami, reverses course to starboard. Opens fire, laser smoke screen. Kowalski, uh, Kowalski and Suzaki reverse course to port. And at 2323, so this is two minutes after Minneapolis has fired her first salvo, Suzaki, Suzukati fires eight torpedoes in the direction of gun flashes from Wright's cruisers. So they have the Italian, the Japanese destroyers do not have radar they are firing based on the gunfire and gun flashes of the american cruisers this is followed by naganami and kwakasi uh, each firing their full loads of eight torpedoes at 2332 and 2333 uh, respectively Meanwhile, the four destroyers of the Japanese column, uh, the Japanese column at the head, well, they carry on sort of going down Guadalcanal uh, coast, allowing the cruisers to pass them in an opposite direction. Once clear of Takanami at 23.28, Kuryosho fired four. And then Oyashu fired eight torpedoes in the direction of Wright's column. They then reverse course and increase speed. Wright's cruisers, in comparison, are maintaining the same course and the same speed. This is they're doing as 44 Japanese torpedoes are heading in their direction. You see... I think some of those claims about the Mark 15 torpedo being fatally flawed are made to make up for the fact that, well, 
the difference in scenario. The Japanese start getting fired up. They start maneuvering and presume there's torpedoes in the water. The Americans start firing. They continue on in a straight line and presume that no one's going to fire a torpedo at them. And I would like to say you do have to blame this theoretically on the rear admiral in charge, but if I was one of those captains, I would well I hope I would have gone. I'm stretching the bounds of my instructions here. I'm supposed to be in a straight line proceeding. I'm going to start wiggling. Just keep wiggling from side to side. Anything to throw off a torpedo solution. The fact that only... Well, the Americans only lose one cruiser sunk and only three are severely damaged is, frankly, luck. At 23.27, as Minneapolis fires her night salvo, Wright decides to start thinking about ordering a course change for his column. Two torpedoes, this is either from Suzu uh, Suzukazi or Takanami, strike her forward. One warhead decides to blow up the aviation fuel storage tanks forward of turret one, and the other knocked out three of the ship's Fire rooms. The bow forward of turret one folds down at a 70 degree angle, and for some reason the ship loses power and steering control. Unfortunately, 37 men are killed, but this is this is why you don't keep your ship going in a straight line in a battle with an enemy who has torpedoes. Less than a minute later. A torpedo hits New Orleans abreast of turret one and blows up the ship's forward ammunition spaces and aviation gasoline storage again. This severs the ship's entire bow forward of turret two. Imagine HMS Eskimo, but on a bigger scale, because this is a heavy cruiser with a heavy cruiser's crew. The bow's twisted to port, the ship's hull is wrenched. And everyone in turrets one and two are killed, either by the shock or by the loss that just goes straight down. New Orleans is forced to revert into a reverse course to starboard and loses steering communications. It's a total of 183 men are killed. Pensacola, the next in stern, a stern column, a stern in the cruiser column, observing Minneapolis and New Orleans taking hits and slowing. Pensacola steers to pass them on the port side, and then once passed, returns to the same base course. At 23.39, Pensacola, unsurprisingly, takes a torpedo abreast the main mast. The explosion spread oil, burning oil throughout the interior across the main deck of the ship, and kills another 125 of her crew. The hit rips away the port outer drive shaft, and the ship takes on a 13 degree list and lost power, communications, and steering. Astern of Pensacola, Honolulu's captain chooses to pass Minneapolis and New Orleans on the starboard side. So let's be honest, you're heading along. The torpedoes are coming from that direction. If you go to the port, you are going to decide which is under attack. If you go to starboard, you're using those damaged ships as human shields. You can consider one side brave, one side sensible, but that's your options. The ship also increases speed to 30 knots, starts manoeuvring radically, and successfully transits the battle area, not taking any cat damage. And keep firing while she kept firing at the disappearing Japanese destroyers. So, you've 
just had an example of what a very quick thinking captain can do. So let's give all the credit to Captain Robert W. Haler. He does have a slight advantage. He has Tisdale aboard, the other Rear Admiral, who seems to have basically gone to his flag captain at, not react. Unfortunately, you then have Northampton. Now, Northampton decides to follow Honolulu to pass damage cruisers ahead to starboard. But unlike Honolulu, Northampton doesn't increase speed or attempt any radical maneuvers. So she's done one out of the three options. At 2348, after returning to her base course, Northampton is hit by two of Kawakazi's torpedoes. One hits 10 feet below the waterline, abreast the aft engine room, and four seconds later, the second hit 40 feet further aft. The aft engine room floods, three or four shafts cease turning, and the ship lifts 10 degrees to port and catches fire. 50 men are killed. Larson, Lamson and Larna, the last two of the ships in the column, the destroyers, fail to locate any targets and exit the battle area to the east after being mistakenly fired on by machine guns from New Orleans. Cole's four destroyers circled completely around Savo Island at maximum speed and re-entered the battle area, but after that, the engagement had already ended, and... At 23.44, Tanaka ordered the ships to break contact and retire from the battle area. When Tanakami fails to respond to radio calls, Tanaka directs Ayashu and Kirioso to go to her assistance. The destroyers located their burning comrade at 0100 hours on the 7th of 1st, but abandoned rescue efforts after detecting American warships in the area. Ayashi and Kirisho departed the sound to rejoin Tanaka's ships, and they returned to short ones, which they reached roughly 10 hours later. Takanami was the only Japanese warship actually hit by American gunfire and seriously damaged during the battle. Northampton's crew were unable to contain the ship's fires, and it listed and began to, ab had to abandon ship at 01.30 hours. This is New Orleans. As Herbert Brown puts it when he goes that evening to look at it, I went at night, I had to see. I walked alongside the silent turret too, and was stopped by a lifeline stretched from the outboard port lifeline to the starter to the side of the turret. Thank God it was there. For one more step, and I would have pitched heads at first into the dark water thirty feet below. The bow was gone. One hundred and twenty-five feet of ship and number one main battery turret with three eight-inch inch guns was were gone. Eighteen hundred tons of ship were gone. Oh my god, those guys I went through all boot camp with, all gone. Long term, they get them back. That is the thing, the Americans can repair their ships. This is Pensacola and New Orleans back in 1943. Northampton, she gets replaced in the aggregate. More ships get built. And the Americans learn a lesson about night fighting. Don't proceed in a straight frigging line. However, they have to get retaught that lesson time and time again, and so do. We can also talk about the British needing to learn that lesson, because let's be honest, some things happen to some Australian cruisers as well. Points. And British cruisers. But they shouldn't have been lost or damaged in the first place. They shouldn't have been there in the first place for that. 
Long term, the Japanese have lost a destroyer. And frankly, if this was a prelude to the, uh, the decisive battle, the Kantai Kesson, they would have loved that. Losing a dis exchanging a destroyer for putting out of action three enemy heavy cruisers and sinking a fourth? Oh my god, that is... That's the planners of the Kantai Kessens' dreams come true. That would be an amazing result. And all delivered to them by an American admiral who kept people going in a straight line because the Americans hadn't really practiced or thought about night fighting. And they hadn't because it didn't make strategic sense for them. If you fight at night, you surrender your advantage of numbers. If you fight at night, you're, approach, you're opening yourself up to all sorts of dangerous outcomes. Because you can see what your enemy are doing. Even with radar, you might be able to see what they're doing. But you might not be able to understand it. And they can pull tricks on you. And night can work both ways far too evenly. Whereas a day fight, your strength of numbers combined with radar, combined with aircraft, that gives you guaranteed victory. So the Americans were concentrated on it. But they'd forgotten the first rule of war. The enemy gets a vote. And then you have this scenario. If you're concentrating night fight on, on day fighting and you haven't done much night fighting, then you have to let the enemy... You, you have to make a decision. You are either going to risk your fleet, like they do here, and possibly risk massive losses, unless you are hubristic enough to think it won't happen, or concede the night to the enemy. They weren't going to concede the night to the Japanese. It would have made Guadalcanal run on for even longer. And frankly, neither side really wants to be in Guadalcanal. It's... So they chuck the ships in. They chuck them in under an admiral who is, I would argue, not constitutionally suited to the realities of night fighting in wartime. Judging by his previous actions and the instructions he's given. Yes, they might well be the best that he can achieve with the fleet he's got, but at which point he either needs to be able to turn around to Halsey and say, we can't do it, or he needs to turn around to his captain and go, I trust you. I'm going to give you the freedom to manoeuvre independently. Just don't slam into each other, please. Something needed to be done. And it is really interesting to me that Honolulu is the one which basically goes, this is not my game of raspberries. I'm going to play it a different way. The moment they can, they do. And Honolulu is, of course, the one which survives. But in many ways, Honolulu is the least valuable, easiest to replace of the cruisers there. Fortune favours the Braves. Well, Fortune favoured, we would seem, the, Jap uh, the Japanese on this evening. I started with a quote from Jingo, and I'm going to finish with a quote from Jingo. And it's an excellent book by Terry Pratchett. Good, good. Please hear, uh, pleased to hear it, Captain. What is the position vis-a-vis -vis heavily armed, well-prepared, and excessively manned armies? Oh, no one's ever heard of fortune favouring them, sir. According to General Tacitus, it's because they favour themselves, said Vimes. He opened the battered book, bits of paper and string indicating his many bookmarks. In fact, men, the General has this to say about ensuring against defeat when outnumbered, outweaponed, and outpositioned. It is, he turned the page, don't have a battle. That could be the argument for Guadalcanal in the whole battle from the Japanese perspective. But in this naval battle, you have three points at which you can start to go, hmm, only having three destroyers which are radar equipped to act as your forward screen. That's iffy. Your flare aircraft not being able to come uh, come to your aid or come uh, not being available. That's iffy. 
Continuing on regardless is brave. But you already at this point in the war know the Japanese are good at night fighting. And you know that because you've been warned by Kincaid, you've been warned by Halsey, you've been prepared for it. On paper, the Task Force 67 is the heavily armed and excessively manned army. But on argu an argument, they are not well prepared. They aren't. They aren't well prepared for their operation. And the Japanese are well prepared. And they are equally well manned. Mm, heavily armed? Well, that depends on your definition of the long lance torpedo. But I'd say it proved fairly effective in this contest. So let's go for quite arm armed. And they did fire 40 of them. And that's the point again. They get off 44 torpedoes. The vast majority do not hit anything. But they fire 44. Against targets which aren't manoeuvring. Which are keeping at a constant speed. That's a dream. That is an absolute dream. From their perspective. The Americans, in contrast, fire 20 torpedoes. 24, depending on if you include other uh, other ships actually sort of firing some torpedoes, but 20 from destroyers against targets which are warned by their own gunfire to start, the Americans' own gunfire, to start manoeuvring. At a less than optimum, when they're in a, the target's already in a less than optimum position, and they don't get any hits. don't have a battle. Because ultimately, even if the Japanese had supplied their troops ashore, those supplies weren't going to do anything for them. They weren't going to win or turn the tide of the battle. The Japanese didn't have the troops ashore, they didn't have the people ashore, they didn't have, even these supplies would not give them fix anything. You are throwing away American surface forces to fight a battle you don't need to because you've already won the battle. The only reason the Japanese aren't admitting it yet is because they're too stubborn and they're being too silly. They should have withdrawn ages ago. Right now. What do we have coming up? Well, we have Brew Ship 63, the Writing Theorist, Corbett, Mahan, Richmond, Sims and Cable, uh, uh, Richmond Sims, Cable and Korshkov coming up on Sunday. And we have a product of the Kantai Kessin Doctrine or something to do, Pearl Harbor, 7th of December. But as you notice, there's a few gaps. Just a few gaps. And well, these gaps are going to be filled. These are the suggestions which didn't make it. Antronaut, hypersonic missiles and their potential effects on 21st century warfare. That is a colossal subject, and I would love to have a go at it, and I will probably have a go at it someday, but um, I'm not going to do it in the Christmas season when I could have Christmas parties to go to. It is conceivable. I know I'm a naval historian, but I am a fun and happy enough personality. Okay, I'm a funny enough personality, I'm not going to go for happy enough, that occasion I do get invited to Christmas parties. And I do a very good ho ho ho. So, sorry? Mm -hmm. Come on, guys, one. Sailor of Austria. The reality behind John Biggin's uh, Proshka series. The semi-fictional ships, smaller and bigger events and places. I have never read that. But if you send me details, I will have a look at it, and then maybe eventually I will, if you suggest this again another time, I will look into it. Bail and Aura. Peloponnesian War, although this is quite a large topic and would be best to lift into small segments. Hmm. Wayne Borin. Driving Alex crazy. What are the most difficult topics in the field to research and why? 
anything that involves diplomats or ordnance that our ordnance works or armor works because despite what some people might seem to believe in my comment section or on on lives their security was massive tight and all encompassing and they tended to get rid of stuff Wayne Boring, the Battle of Pell Station from C.J. Icheri's book, uh, Down Below Station. The implications of the technology and the socio-political situation between Earth, the company fleet, the stations, the merchants, and the Cytene. If you haven't the novel, I recommend it highly, and if you like the music... Okay. I'm going to need to look it up. So, these are the December vote suggestions which got to through to be turned into something. James Carroll's, what of Fraun, Vader, and Vader? Uh, sir, uh, what of Fraun and Zade, uh, Vader served the Japanese Empire, or Fraun and Poweyon? Aaron Evans, Luftwaffe anti-shipping operations in the Second World War. Carl Henshaw, British night fighting doctrine in the Second World War. Simon Spratt, the 1905, 1906, and 1911 Morocco crises, which I think I've done before, but I'm happy to do again. Vision, the Battle of the Thames, Fraun tries for London, part two of the Tarkin Fraun World War One alternate history series. Vision, Selborne Fisher Screen, uh, the integration, then the integration of the executive and engineering branch of the Royal Navy, 1900 to 1925. Vision, 80 years war, uh, uh, years after Pearl Harbor, its lessons and after effects. Wayne Boring, four European blue water navies were not involved in World War II, Portugal, Spain, and Sweden, uh, Sweden and Turkey. What was the strategic situation of each of these powers, and what resources, ships, infrastructure, did they have, and what do we know about their defense plans? Wayne Boring, the Royal Canadian Navy, geopolitical considerations, etc., etc. Wayne Boring, an in-depth consideration of the Royal Navy, uh, of Royal Navy strategic and tactical thought, all the use of iron submarines and iron anti-submarine forces between the wars. Hmm. Bill and Laura, Peloponnesian War. You see, there was a point at which I was not going to do that, but then I thought I'll add it in. Ian Carl, what if the courageous and glory, uh, courageous and glorious survived, and what changes would there have resulted to iron carrier practice and strategy? Rick Osava, what if Admiral Kimmel had two and a half days warning that Pearl Harbor was going to be attacked by six Japanese fleet carriers and their escorts on the 7th of 7th, 1941? What would he have done, and what would have been the outcome of the battle? That's an interesting one. So, how did I change it into the vote topics? Well, I had to make some decisions. James Carroll's became what if Fraun and Gilead Kefalion served the Japanese Empire in place of Isokuru, Yamamoto, and Chushi Nagoma. I thought that was a quite an interesting true to replace. This is the point. I have to, uh, When I'm doing these, I like to replace and do it as discreet as possible. So I like to know who I'm replacing, and I like to be going in with sensible people for their roles. And I did consider Vader, but Vader... Not really, I didn't really think it would work. I thought Pallion works better to replace Nagumo, and I thought Fraun replacing Yamamoto was quite cool. Aaron Evans, how successful were Luftwaffe anti shepping operations in the Second World War? I thought it was good to add in a question. Carl Hanshaw, how was British night fighting doctrine developed for and then in practice during World War II? Again, you might have noticed I've turned these into sort of questions from their things. Samus Pratt, 1905, 1906, and 1911 the Morocco crises. Vision, the 1917 Battle of the Thames. Because that seems to be quite a popular idea. I get messages on Discord about that. Wayne Boring, what was the strategic situation for each of the four European Blue Water navies that were not involved in World War II? Bill and Laura, the maritime lessons of the Peloponnesian War. Go on, I'll give it a go if you really want me to. In Carl, what if Courageous and Glorious had survived and what changes would have resulted not to our own carrier practice strategy? I'm fairly sure we have an extra carry involved at Taranto. Not sure which one. I'm gonna have to do I'd have to do some work to figure that one out. Uh Richard Vasaba, what if Admiral Kimmel had two and a half days warning of that Pearl Harbor was going to be attacked on the seventh of seventh, nineteen forty-one? Vision, the consequences and outcomes of the Selborne Fisher scheme, nineteen hundred to nineteen twenty-five. Wayne Boring, the Royal Canadian Canadian Navy from fouling to the start of World War II. Vision, 80 years after Pearl Harbor, its lessons and after effects. Wayne Boring, strategic and tactical thinking of the on RN submarines and RN anti-submarine forces between the wars. And yes, to an extent, those questions are shortened so they actually fit shortened so they actually fit in the patron question system for the uh, thing. So 
I hope you've enjoyed this video. I hope you found it interesting and useful. It's going to be rather late going up. In fact, it might end up getting delayed till tomorrow because basically teaching went on longer today than it was supposed to. And I left this for, to be recorded today because I was supposed to have time today. And I thought actually recording on the day would be actually quite fun and quite nice. And I've done it before and it's been fine and I've got it up on time. But life happened. So apologies. Enjoy. Thank you very much. I hope you enjoyed the videos. And please, if you do get all the way to the end, because as I like, I do like to know if people like the videos and if they've got to the end. What I'm going to say is this. These are numbered 1 to 13. So, I'm going to throw in an extra topic. Whichever one, numbered 1 to 13, gets the most votes in terms of comments down below, I will add in an extra live between Christmas and New Year on it. And the question, the thing will be, if it's the, if the numbers are the same ones as the ones which win the patron vote, I will then go down to the one below that. Okay? So if Whichever two win the patron vote, if, they, if they're the two which also come highest in the comments, I will go to the comments and I will look for the third highest, or third most mentioned number. Okay? Thank you very much. Remember, it's 1 to 13. I'll expand it so you can quickly see. Thank you.